We open the scripture again today to Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and specifically 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as we continue the series on spiritual gifts. Today we look at the seventh spiritual gift, which is described for us in verses 7 through 11 of 1 Corinthians 12. To each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And then verse 10, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. The topic today is the gift of discerning of spirits. We might well ask as a starter, what is the discerning of spirits? The Bible teaches us that we have the Spirit of God, there is a spirit within man, and there are evil spirits. To discern spirits, therefore, is to distinguish whether a person is acting or speaking by the Spirit of God, by his own human spirit, or by the influence or possession of an evil spirit. The Scriptures tell us that discernment is especially needed at certain moments. For example, to distinguish whether or not a person who brings a spiritual message is from God. The Pharisees, in respect to Jesus, did not have discernment. For they said that He spoke and under the influence of evil spirits, when true discernment functioning would have said that he speaks by the Spirit of God. However, some non-Christians once exercised good discernment in the town of Berea when the Apostle Paul brought the Christian message there. They heard the Word of God and searched the Scriptures to see whether these things be so. They took time to discern whether the man who came to them spoke and under his own human spirit spoke by an evil spirit or spoke by the Spirit of God. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14.29 that in the Christian congregation when the prophets speak their words are to be weighed and 1 John 4 tells us their spirits are to be tested. So one of the functions of discernment is to distinguish whether or not a person bringing a spiritual message is from God. The functioning of the gift of discernment therefore when it is going on in Christian congregation will prevent the kinds of things we saw in the Jim Jones Guyana massacre. Long before had the gift discernment been operating in that congregation, there would have been a judgment rendered against that kind of leadership and teaching. Where discernment is absent, terrible things can happen. Another function of discernment is to distinguish outward appearances from inner realities. In Acts chapter 8, the sorcerer Simon Magus, seeing Peter give the gift of the Spirit, wants to buy it. Many, a person perhaps would have been enthused that someone was so earnest for the things of God. But Peter, by the gift of the Spirit, saw Simon Magus' inward motivation and saw that he really wanted it to serve his own ends and perceived that he was full of bitterness and bondage to sin. Jesus once exercised the discernment, the gift of discernment in respect to Simon Peter. When Jesus announced that he was going to the cross, Simon Peter took him and began to rebuke him that he not go to the cross. From outward appearances, it would seem that Peter was doing the right and protective thing. But Jesus, reading the heart, realizes that Peter's words are nothing less than what Satan himself would say, that it's Satan who seeks to keep him from going to the cross. Therefore, Jesus distinguishes from the outer appearances and the inward reality. Jesus, in Revelation chapter 2, looks at the Ephesian church, which by all odds from human reckoning was a good church and a doctrinally pure church. But Jesus sees that it's left its first love. He discerns the outward appearance from the inward reality. The third function of discernment is to distinguish whether or not a person is possessed by an evil spirit. We live in a culture where this does not happen perhaps as much, or at least we don't see it as much as you would in an Eastern culture, where there's a different emphasis uh, upon uh, worship uh, toward the gods. I think what C.S. Lewis has said, though, about Western society is so valid that uh, Satan reading Western culture uh, realizes it would be futile to try to persuade people that he exists. So his major strategy as as a world power is to persuade people he doesn't exist. And in Western society, he infiltrates ideas. He infiltrates with moods and with movements, with, uh, with elements of philosophy and thinking which destroy the fabric of spirituality in human life. Christians need the ability to distinguish whether or not a person is possessed of an evil spirit. Sometimes Christians have gone seriously amiss in this regard and have discerned every form of evil as a result of demon possession. 
Several years ago, I walked into a church foyer that was filled with tapes and books on demon possession. There wasn't anything on that table, but somehow it wasn't related to, to demon possession. I quickly came to the conclusion that that must be a specialty in that particular sort of church. I found out later that some of them were coughing up demons in brown paper bags. And I thought, how really sick and distorted an emphasis this, this is. To blame all physical and mental illness as though it were possession and calling things like Loneliness and paranoia and inferiority, identifying them as a spirit of inferiority that needs to be cast out or a spirit of loneliness or a spirit of paranoia or a spirit of fantasy or a spirit of nicotine. I would like to cast out the spirit of fat, but I have not yet found a successful way to do that. We must uh, distinguish between something which is in the uh, human spirit and something which is, in an, which is attributable to an evil spirit. What is the difference between discernment? Another kind of question. We're just looking preliminarily at some things to get started. What is the discernment of spirits to distinguish between human, demonic, and God's spirit? What is the difference then between discernment functioning in every believer and the gift of discernment? As we have gone through the gifts, we've noticed that the gifts describe qualities that are meant to be present in every believer. From time to time, we all need wisdom, don't we? From time to time, we all need insight and knowledge. We need uh, to exercise faith. We have the privilege of coming for healing. We have the privilege of praying for miracles. But there, there are some persons at special occasions for whom the gifts uh, in these areas come in rich and special quality. Discernment is a necessary attribute as a personality trait for every Christian, for every Christian needs to be able to tell good from evil and right from wrong to discern those things. The writer of Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 tells us that Solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The most basic discernment in all of life, which all of us must come to, is to answer Jesus' question. Who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, when you answer that question, you are making a discernment. If you say, Jesus, Jesus, I don't know who he is. Perhaps he operates on his own human accord. You are discerning something different about Jesus than he discerned about himself. Who is Jesus? Discernment as a Christian begins with an answer to that question. Does Jesus drive out demonic spirits by the Spirit of God or by an evil spirit? That was what the Pharisees wrestled with. So discernment as a quality should be present in every one of us. We all are to discern who Jesus is. Discernment as a special gift, though, arises in moments when Often there is a challenge. In fact, I am convinced, based upon my examination of instances of discernment from Scripture, that the gift of discernment does not function by someone going out and looking for something to discern, but arises rather when an event or situation triggers the need for discernment. It's a reactive thing. It's an especially important equipment of the Spirit for those having spiritual oversight over others since they are called to guard the flock of God and they must be discerning in terms of what influences they allow in respect to that flock. A third question. How do we discern demonic involvement in temptations to sin and to human life? This is where I'm going to focus today. I'm going to narrowly come in on this gift because I think many Christians can be confused on the matter of when it comes to sin in our life, what is the source? Is it our own human nature? Is it temptation from demonic origin? Is it oppression from evil spirits? Or is it possession? And I want to spend some moments focusing in on that today so as to help us all be better discerners. And then when the need comes for a specific discernment, we'll have scriptural patterns to use so that the gift can function off the base of scriptural teaching. Let's talk about, first of all, the fact in respect to sin that uh, we do have temptations that arise out of our own sinful human nature that don't have any demonic involvement at all. You and I are quite capable of sinning without outside help. Several Sunday nights ago, I spoke on the theme, Why Doesn't God Kill the Devil? And I said, if God did kill the devil today, I doubt that it would change a whole lot in you and in me. Because once the uh, sin tendency has been placed, it, it is like a seed which keeps on growing. It really doesn't even need to be fed by an outside force. It will grow of itself. Jeremiah said, The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Jesus said, From within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, 
adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly, all these evils come from inside. James 1.14 says, Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. So, in respect to temptation, probably most of us face the fact that we are tempted by desires arising out of our own sinful human nature and probably the majority of temptations that are faced by all of us in this room have to do with that category. These are also called the works of the flesh, that is, that part of our nature which is alienated from God because of sin. There is a second kind of temptation, though, in respect to sin that does arise from demonic origin or satanic origin. Jesus had no sinful nature within himself, but he was tempted. What was the source of his temptation? Not from within himself, but from outside. Therefore, he is met by Satan in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4. He undergoes temptation arising from satanic origin. Paul experiences this as a messenger of the gospel, an apostle. He has what is called a messenger of Satan, buffet him and afflict him and provide a thorn in his flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Satan filled Ananias' heart to lie, Acts chapter 5, an instance of temptation arising out of demonic origin. And no doubt in Ananias' case, he had begun to open his life in disobedience to the Lord and that provided an entry for special temptation against him. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we fight against supernatural forces. We do not simply fight with the flesh. We fight against demonic and satanic power. Yielding to our own sinful influences or... Being involved in occultic situations can especially provide openings for demonic temptation. Let me give an illustration of the first, yielding to sinful influences. The Gospel of John tells us that Judas regularly stole from the purse the apostolic funds. That regular stealing from the purse made him all that much more susceptible to temptation when the moment arose that, as the Gospel tells us, Satan entered Judas' heart. Jesus described it this way in John chapter 8, 34. Everyone who goes on committing sin is a slave to sin. That is to say, as we yield to our sinful human nature repetitively repetitively, and do not seek forgiveness or reconciliation with God, we then can become especially open to demonic temptation, which could create a fall within us of greater magnitude. Or it may be we are doing God's will in a special kind of way in our lives and we are not tempted from within, but we are tempted from outside. Jesus has taught us to pray to stay away from this kind of temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There's no way we cannot be tempted with our own sinful human impulses, but we can very definitely pray to stay away from this kind of encounter, and if we get involved in it, that we will be delivered from it. A third area of demonic involvement in temptations to sin and in human life is what might be called demonic oppression. Here is a powerful influence of demons coming against an individual but do not have possession of that individual. An Old Testament example of this, of course, is Saul, who, following his intrusion into the priestly office and his disobedience of the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 13 and 15, an evil spirit comes upon him episodically or occasionally for the rest of his life to torment him. And his torment was infrequently relieved by David's playing and ministering to him in song. Demonic oppression can come in several ways, and Merrill Unger, Unger, the biblical scholar from Dallas Theological Seminary, has summarized uh, three ways that demonic oppression comes from the New Testament's viewpoint. One way that demonic oppression may come is through blindness and hardness of heart toward the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4.4 The God of this age has blinded the hearts of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. What, what is being said here? That resistance to the gospel is not only because of human will, but that human will against Christ is added onto by the God of this age who blinds hearts. I, of course, have had experiences to see this, and I've um, seen it in individuals, and I have seen it, I believe, in cultures. And it's not my normal practice from the, from the pulpit to single out other faiths But I cannot help but recalling my impressions of demonic oppression as I traveled in some Muslim countries several years ago, especially in Istanbul, 
and in Izmir, Turkey, to cite examples. And I think the same kind of atmosphere prevails in my childhood years in northwest China and also in Iran today, where the gospel has had absolutely no door of entry for 13 centuries. We're in a country of 40 million people. There are 50 Christians. That this is not simply a matter of human beings not accepting the gospel. It is a matter of demonic kinds of oppression which closes people's minds to the reality of Christ and produces then perverted forms of human behavior. Demonic oppression can certainly take place too in a very sensually saturated society where people, because of sensuality, refuse to open their lives up to the reality of the gospel of Christ. Oppression can come in the form of apostasy and doctrinal corruption. 1 Timothy 4.1 The Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Here is a judgment upon the Jim Jones kinds of things in our culture. Oppression, which brings apostasy and doctrinal corruption. And oppression can also cause the indulging and sinful, defiling behavior. Peter has a whole chapter on this in 2 Peter chapter 2. Persons become involved in demonic oppression through personal and continual involvement in sin or by family or personal involvement in the occult. Now, there's a fourth category of demonic possession itself. As an adult, even when I was away from the Christian faith, I never had a slightest bit of difficulty in believing there was such a thing as demons because in my Tibetan border experiences as kids, I have encountered many demon-possessed persons. I know of the reality of a state that is produced because a demonic spirit invades and takes control of a person, takes control of their body and their personality. And that it's not simply mental illness nor some sort of uh, 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 illness that is that people are misdiagnosing in a primitive sense as though it were demon possession, but it is in reality the invasion of a spirit into another person's life. As you look through the Gospels, you come across many instances of demonic possession. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are seven specific instances of demonic possession as well as many summary moments when it is described that many persons are coming to Jesus who are possessed. In the book of Acts, there is uh, one specific account of exorcism, two general accounts of exorcism, and one account of an encounter with exorcism that backfires. And as I have filtered through all these accounts anew this week, I have drawn up some characteristics of demon possession. I present them because there appears in some parts of the church today to be a good deal of confusion on demon possession and what it is. And I think by looking at the Scripture, we get our base. And when we know what the Scripture says demon possession is, we don't have to rely upon guesses or, or, uh, or human identification. What are the characteristics of demon possession? First, physical manifestation. A demon will manifest itself physically. It will most frequently be in the form of disordered behavior, although on a, a couple of occasions in the Gospel, the possession was paralleled by a physical malady, such as deafness or loss of speech. These appear to be parallel and not necessarily related. Disordered behavior. The Capernaum demoniac. In Mark chapter 1, sitting in in the worshiping audience, like this audience this morning, suddenly in the presence of Jesus, in the middle of his sermon, jumps up and interrupts the service, crying out with a loud voice. And the spirit convulsing the man comes out of him. Physical manifestation. The Gadarene demoniac, Mark chapter 5, is a wild man who lives among the tombs on the mountains, has often been bound with fetters and chains, but the fetters he broke in part, the chains he wrenched apart. He was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. He physically manifested possession. In other words, possession does not keep itself as a secret. It's not just a big secret between me and the evil spirit, but the possession must manifest itself. And it's interesting in the Gospels that people who weren't even Christians knew that a person was possessed. It's often a diagnosis that a non-Christian can make about the ter terrible disorder in a human personality. The second uh, characteristic of demonic possession in the Scripture is that it is self-destructive. It has self-destructive and often violent behavior. At Capernaum, the man that I just talked about in the synagogue shook the man violently as he came out of him. And the Gadarene demoniac had terribly bizarre behavior of self-destruction, bruising himself with stones, always crying out, living in tombs. That would, can you imagine yourself living by mausoleums, for example? Destructive and violent behavior. And by the way, there can be gradations in possession. The Capernaum demoniac was a, at least a quiet enough to be able to sit in a synagogue service. The Gadarene demoniac would have never been able to do that. You couldn't have gotten him into a building. You had to bring him in in a straight jacket and gag. There was a boy that Jesus uh, 
cured of demon possession in Mark chapter 9. The demons threw him to the ground, into the fire and the water to kill him. He foamed at the mouth, he gnashed his teeth, and he became rigid. All self-destructive behavior, violent behavior. The third characteristic of demonic possession is that the evil spirit speaks, thereby differentiating himself from the person. Therefore, totally different from mental illness, which has no possession of an evil spirit. The demoniac spirit speaks and will say, will identify himself as a separate person from him or her. Jesus once asked the gathering demoniac, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. He had a clear voice, all of his own, that belonged to the evil spirit. Fourth, the demons always knew who Jesus is. Always knew. Again, this separates from mental illness. When Jesus came into the midst of a person who was demon-possessed, they cried out with a confession that was months and years ahead of other people's confession. They would say, Thou art the Son of God. You're the Holy One of God. Have you come to torment us before the time? They knew who He was. You show me a person who has a demon, a demon in that person, and I'll show you a demon who knows who Jesus is. That's why you cast out in the name of Jesus because He's won the victory on the cross of Calvary and in the empty grave. They're always concerned in the Gospels that Jesus has come to destroy them. Fifth, frequently when a demon is exercised, a convulsive exit occurs and then the person is left limp and calm. And as Jesus uh, is said uh, to cure the gathering demoniac, the man was sitting there clothed and in his right mind. What are the characteristics of Jesus dealing with demons? Well, first of all, I think it's important to note he never told anybody they had a demon. He never walked up to anyone and said, you have a demon. This is not a form of discernment. It's not a form of exorcism. There are some people in the body of Christ today that walk around and think they can go up to a person and say, you have a demon. I say, bah humbug. If you'll forgive me on that point, being that crass. But that's not the way Jesus cast out demons. Jesus didn't need to go discerning that somebody had a demon because the demon identified itself in his presence. Where there are spiritual and godly people, the demon will manifest itself if it's there. If it's not there, you don't have to go guessing it into existence. Another thing Jesus did about demons is he ordered silence. He did not allow demons to speak other than when they first erupted. Then he ordered them to be silent. They could talk no more. He was not interested in getting about what's going on in the demon world so we can write a book and publish the tape of the month. You know, None of that kind of baloney. He ordered the demons to be quiet and he is not interested in titillating the, the minds of his disciples with all the information of the underworld that demons can provide. The third thing is he counseled his disciples' prayer and faith in respect to exorcism. And especially in one difficult exorcist case where the disciples could not cast a demon out of a boy, he said the reason why they could not was they did not, they did not have prayer and they did not have faith. Fourth, he always commanded exit. He never laid his hands upon demon-possessed persons, so I'm not so certain that's excluded, but he always spoke and the word was sufficient. And fifth, he left the person whole. He never partially cast something out. Say, well, a few days later we'll get get to the rest. It was immediate. Total deliverance. Seeing as how these are characteristics of how the Lord confronted demonic persons, I have some, what I'd call, counsel against, quote, charismatic demonologists who are sometimes present in the body of Christ today and identifying all human maladies as attributable to demon possession. There are three unhealthy aspects to the practice of explaining personal behavior in terms of demon possession. Let me share what those unhealthy aspects are. You come up to a person and say, you're, the reason why there's sin in your life is because there is a demon. You have, in doing that, first of all, removed responsibility from the person. He's off the hook or she's off the hook. can simply say, in the words of Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it. We don't have to exercise responsibility if it's, a de- if it's a demon in us. We don't have to do anything. All we need to do is get it cast out. If it doesn't get cast out, then we can repeat the behavior because we're not responsible for it. A second devastating thing that it does is it ravages personhood. I have known persons in the body of Christ, young Christians, who some misguided person has told them they have an evil spirit and the feeling that that leads within them, the lack of security in God, the terrible Uh, things that that does, especially to a person already starts out with a low sense of self-esteem, it is devastating and a travesty. I have been in a meeting once, uh, maybe I'm the only person who had this kind of experiences, but we're, this never happened under my parents' ministry, by the way, they were always really, really sober in in what they did in this area, but once in a meeting I remember somebody was purporting to cast out demons and told everyone else in the congregation to to be in a state of prayer because uh, when the demon was cast out, it would enter them if they weren't. As a kid, about 10 years old, I sat there petrified, you know. 
Jesus never cast out demons in one person just to send them into another person. What, what purpose does that serve? He sent them into pigs, or better yet, the underworld. Um, this, and this whole feeling, this terrible feeling, you know, do I have a demon? Once had a person uh, tell me, when I, I was sharing some, uh, some area in my own life where I needed to be strengthened, and I needed to deal with some matters, he said to me, uh, uh, well, that's an evil spirit. You know, once you start coughing, and you'll cough it up. Just incredible kinds of things. I share this with you because you're going to, if you're in the body of Christ, especially any length of time, you're going to find that there are people who come along with these sorts of emphasis. And it's better to be forewarned than later to run into problems. A third kind of thing that this sort of charismatic demonology does is it builds unhealthy personalities because it, it doesn't help us to deal with our own sinful urges, confessing them and working through them. Jesus, for example, did not cast the demon of lust out of the woman taken in adultery. He did not cast the demon of unbelief out of Zacchaeus. He did not cast, the, or I should say, the demon of avarice out of Zacchaeus. He did not cast the demon of unbelief out of Peter when he denied him three times. Paul didn't cast the demon of contentiousness out of Yodia and Syneche when they disagreed with one another. All these were areas where they needed to work on in terms of their own sinful propensities. While I am on the subject of charismatic demonologists, I would also like to give you a warning about those who come along with words of personal prophecy, since these two things tend to run together. I would like to warn you about anyone who comes up to you and says, I have a personal prophecy for you. I would like to warn you to not listen to them and to, in the name of the Lord, refuse their counsel. Why, you say, would you ever do that? Because when the instances in the New Testament of personal prophecy occur, they have two conditions always attached to them. One, it always occurs in a group setting where there are witnesses that can affirm what is being said. When Agabus personally prophesies to Paul, it is in a company. It is not a one-to-one -one encounter. The second thing is that the personal prophecy must agree with your own spirit. It is not counter to what God is showing you in your own spirit. That's why Paul rejects the personal prophets at Tyre when they tell him not to go to Jerusalem because it did not agree with what God had put in his own spirit. God has not called you to surrender control of your life to someone else and someone else's direction. That's your responsibility as a child of the king. Personal prophecy can come along if it's in the right sort of context, can be inspirational and helpful. If it's in a group, but if it has safeguards on it, but otherwise, it can just be nothing else than a cheap counterfeiting of fortune telling under, the, under a Christian guise. And I would encourage you to repudiate it. Do I, do I send a little hard at time? Am I a little hard today? I Not normally this... I just hear stories from time to time that get me really, get my dander up, so to speak, because people are not really reading the scripture and, and flying off into that experience and this experience that I, I can get a little sharp edged, okay? We all have failures. Is that one of mine? I hope it's a strong word, though, that you won't ignore it. How can we discern how to become spiritually whole? That's where I'd like to conclude. Because we all want to be spiritually whole. How do we discern that? If a person is possessed of demons, the only way to wholeness is through exorcism. You can't counsel it away. The only way is to cast out the evil spirit in the name of the Lord. If a person is oppressed by demons, the oppression may be from sin in our life or involvement with the occult. If that is the case, that sin or involvement should be confessed, repented of, and repudiated. If the oppression comes as a result of being on a spiritual mission or, or comes in the context of your Christian walk and you just are being harassed, then lift up the name of Jesus. My mother, in her the few pages she wrote of her memoirs before she passed away, related a story from her early days as a missionary in China and Tibet this occurred in her first years there. She was outside Peking and uh, she had been uh, with her sister who was also single placed in an upstairs room where there were two large idols. These idols were larger than life size and, and huge squat figures. She having no respect for idols just draped them with sheets and went to sleep. Her sister and her cot was between the idols and one, one cot on this side and one on the other side. In the middle of the night, my mother woke up and her bed was levitating. It was floating in the air. She sensed incredible demonic uh, presence in the room. 
and reached forth from within her to call out the name of Jesus and it was just like cotton being in her mouth. Almost impossible to get out the name of the Lord. Finally succeeded in getting out the name of the Lord and the bed came down to the ground and stayed there the rest of the night. I've had that same experience as a missionary kid myself staying overnight at the uh, Lamasary of Gumbum, a place of 100,000 idols in Tibet. The night before the annual Butter God Festival and the celebration of the dance to the Lord of Hell and Death. Demonic spirits keeping the whole family awake all night long able literally to say nothing but the name of Jesus and remind the enemy of the victory of Jesus Christ on the cross. And there alone is victory from the oppression. Don't think that demonic oppression is a delusion of uh, simple-minded, naive, pietistic Christian people. It is a reality. There is a spiritual world beyond the rationalistic Western mind. Demonic oppression, when it occurs, find the evil spirit, Plead the name of Christ. Satan knows who won at Calvary. Third, what about temptation from satanic origin? Use the word of God. Jesus used the word of God and resist the devil. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. What about temptation from your own sinful, fallen human nature? When it's primarily coming from within your own evil desires, sometimes fostered by outside temptation, but primarily coming from within. I have here in the outline today a set of things to do. recognize the sinful impulse, remove yourself from the temptation-producing environment, confess the sinful desire, share your struggle with other Christians who will pray for you. One of the things the enemy likes to do is make us think we're the only ones that are going through it. Seek thought patterns which are pure and wholesome and live in the grace of God. I'd like time to develop all those. I'm afraid as they lay, they almost look like a laundry list, a too easy prescription for dealing with it. But these are the principles in God's words to deal with it. And when when you are wrestling with temptation from your fallen sinful nature, look at these as a clue to help you. I want to especially key in on the last point. Live in the grace of God. If you try to get free from your fallen human nature by your own self-effort, you are going to fall flat. You are going to wind up a Roman 7 kind of Christian who discovers that when you try to do good, evil is always at hand and that the law of God will always condemn you Only the Spirit of God can bring you release because only the Spirit of God can tell you that you are free in Christ Jesus. You are saved by grace and not by works. Live in the grace of God. One of the best perceptions I ever had of the grace of God and what it it means to know God was when our girl was three years of age, a number of years ago, and she was in the back seat of our car and I was driving along and she said to me, Daddy, Jesus is kicking me in the tummy. And I turned around and I thought to myself, what stray word is this? She said, Jesus is kicking me in the tummy. My theological mind was horrified. And I said uh, to her, well, Evangeline, what's wrong with you? Why are you saying that? She said, I have a stomachache. And I still didn't put things together. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, we had been teaching her that Jesus lives in her heart. She came to the conclusion that if she had a stomachache, Jesus was in there doing the kicking. She was just making a logical deduction. And as I thought about this, I said to myself, kids are so stupid. And then I remember what Martin Luther said one day in one of his table talks when his kids were playing around the table creating a big ruckus. He said, oh, Lord, you said we must become like children to enter the kingdom of God. Dear Lord, he said, do we have to become such idiots? And I'm still in this train of consciousness thing, and I think, yeah, Lord, and you did say, except you become as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What did you mean by that? Oh, it's possible to preach on things and still not know what they mean. What did you mean by that? Except you become as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then all of a sudden it opened to me, just marvelous truth that opened to me. It said, your daughter, she doesn't know much about me, does she? But she knows me. You don't, she doesn't know much about you, does she? And she really didn't. When you think about head knowledge or information knowledge, or the philosophers call it cognitive knowledge, you think of knowledge in terms of um, uh, what, where, who, when kind of things. Uh, she didn't know what six foot tall was. That's what I was. She didn't know what a doctor's degree was. When she was, went through the daily vacation Bible school line to get her certificate, she got her doctoral degree. How, how easy it is to get a doctorate these days. Uh, when, uh, <laughs> when 
She didn't know what marriage was. She had no concept of existence. If, she, if her relationship to me was judged on the basis of what she knew about me, she'd have flunked the test. But she knew me, and she knew me a lot better than people that knew a lot about me. Because there's another kind of knowledge, relational knowledge. A knowledge that comes through family, through relationships. And the Lord said, except you become as a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. In other words, if you wait to know God until you know everything about God, you'll never know God. Because you cannot know Him simply on the informational level. You must know Him on the relational level. That's why Jesus says, except you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You must know Him on the relational level. You must enter into His family. That's why a five-year-old child can know God far more profoundly than the wisest man who never came into a relationship with God. Because knowing is relational before it is informational. Now granted, when we come into a relationship, we gain information. My daughter now does know what six foot tall is. She does know what a doctor's degree is. And uh, we will know as we come relationally into Christ something about Him. But to know Him is first. And I say this, that as we wrestle with uh, the flesh, with simple human impulses, that we must never do that wrestling isolated from the fact that we are God's child and we've been brought into relationship with Him. Because if we try to wrestle with that, outside of our relationship with God, we're going to be on the outside looking in and we're going to be orphaned and terribly alone and without help. We must look at our life in terms of our identity. We have been birthed by the Spirit into a living relationship with God through Christ Jesus. And in that relationship we are held. And in that relationship we have triumph and victory. And I want you to have that relationship. And I want you to grow in that relationship. It's in the safety of that relationship that the Christian life is lived out. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. We do praise you today, our loving Father, for the gift of grace that has been given to us. And we praise you for your word, which is a light to our feet, a lamp for our path. We thank you that you have spoken the words, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We thank you that you have said, I have come to set you free. He who is free shall be free indeed. We thank you for the word which says, If I be lifted up, not if evil spirits be lifted up, but if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. We lift you up today, Lord. We confess you as Lord of our life, And we discern, even in this prayer, your identity, your lordship. Lord, if there is a person here this day who has never discerned who you really are, has never come into that personal awareness of you which occurs when you come into our life at our invitation, then let them in this moment of prayer discern who you are. That you are not just another man speaking, not just another wise teacher, not some great moral leader, but you are of God, the very Son of God. Christ, who has come into the world. May that be our common confession today. And may you be with us in the moments when we run against our sinful human nature. May we remember that you are greater than that sinful human nature and that that sinful human nature has been swallowed up in your victory at Calvary and you've embraced our body in your resurrection power so that it will be glorified forever with you. And it's now developing in a life pattern rather than a death pattern. May we remember when we come against oppression or even possession that evil spirits are nothing compared to you, that you are the Lord. And we confess your strong and mighty name through Christ Jesus. Amen.